So I'm delighted to welcome Ambassador Yusuf al to this interview with the National Across the Oceans and um, on our virtual Zoom meeting. Uh, Ambassador Ateba, I hope you're keeping well. Very well. It's great to be with you again, Mina. It's good to see you. Um, this is quite a moment to be speaking to you. You have become the first UAE uh, official to speak directly to the Israeli public in the sense of writing an op-ed that's just come out, directly speaking to the Israeli population about the concerns of annexation, of further annexation of Palestinian lands. So my first question to you is, why the op-ed? What's the message you're trying to get across? Well, the op-ed was designed and written in a way to send a direct message. And as you know, in the media, one of the first questions you ask yourself is, who's my audience? And for this particular message and this particular time, the audience was Israel. So instead of writing it and placing it in the national or in something here in the US, I thought it was important to speak directly to them. That's why we did it. And what is your main message? That this will be a setback. That this will be a setback that will undo a lot of the progress that we've seen, right? A lot of the things that get highlighted these days are when an Etihad flight lands in Ben Gurion Airport or when an Israeli athlete participates in a competition in Abu Dhabi or Dubai. This will make these kinds of things so much more difficult. This will give a platform for extremists. This will allow people to try to manipulate and adopt the Palestinian issue for their own benefit. And it will be it's a very big setback for the things that I think everybody feels is progress in the right direction. Can I ask you, so you say it's a setback. I mean, some people are saying it means that the two-state solution becomes impossible. Is that your feeling? I, I think if we proceed in that direction, you get into a very negative spiral that becomes much more difficult to pull yourself away from, and it makes the two-state solution even more elusive. So we believe in the two-state solution. We believe that the two sides should sit down and talk. These types of steps are exactly what would prevent these kinds of solutions. Now, you, you speak about normalization. Um, you spoke about very important symbolic moments where we've seen the UAE open to the idea of reaching out to the Israelis or, or having some sort of relationship with Israel. But what's the thinking behind that? What is the UAE strategy when it comes to dealing with Israel on one side, but also thinking about how we can actually get to peace in the Middle East? I think attitudes towards Israel, like attitudes towards everything else, including race, including uh, social issues, are changing. They're changing. And so uh, if you look around the region, there are countries that have open relationships with Israel, like uh, Jordan and Egypt. There are countries that have more discreet relationships with Israel. There are definitely common interests. And so this type of cooperation is not, it, it really is the worst kept secret. It, it takes place. But Attitudes are changed because they see Israel as an opportunity. And this type of behavior is the kind of setback that will change people's impression of, of Israel. And again, that's why we chose to write it in an Israeli publication to speak directly to Israelis. And yet, you know, this idea of, as you said, this would be a setback, and yet the occupation continues. We've seen other moves, even if there isn't the annexation as such, we haven't really seen a lot of Israeli moves towards peace or towards ending the Palestinian occupation. So how do you feel that that can shift? How can you get the, I mean, and this isn't a reflection on the Israeli public as such, rather than the government and the moves that they've made, and kind of the coalition that was formed, really with annexation being a key part of the party program, let's say, or the government program. So how can that shift? How can that change? I think it, has to happen through demonstration of efforts. And we've seen in the last couple of years that there's been very little backlash when an Israeli athlete participates or when Israel gets invited to Expo. You know, you see indications that these are things that are moving the relationship towards a more open, cooperative state between the two countries. And, you know, one of the interesting things it's you know, there are a lot of countries that have open relationships with Israel that have very tough political positions on peace and on annexation. So the two are not exclusive. You can have a relationship 
you can have a conversation where you agree on one set of issues and disagree on another set of issues. Now, you writing the op-ed, you speaking in this way is quite public. And as you say, in some ways, you know, we've seen these sorts of things happening, but to speak so directly um, about the issue, why? Why the timing and why are you speaking so directly? Because I don't want there to be any confusion about what our position is. is. I think it's important to be public. I, want, I think it's important to be clear and direct that you know, every country has their own decision-making apparatus and can make decisions based on their own national interests. But I felt it was important to make sure they understand the consequences of this decision outside of the normal bilateral Israeli-Palestinian track, which often these decisions are made based on that lens or on that perspective. How does it affect Palestine? How does it affect the negotiations? But there's a much broader impact here that has not been, I think, part of the debate. I think there is going to be tremendous amount of pressure on countries like Jordan, who have demographic challenges and economic challenges. This will make their challenges even more difficult. And as we said in the op-ed, Jordan's stability is something that is instrumental to the region, instrumental to Israel, and many of us take it for, take for granted, to be honest. And I thought it was really important to make sure people understand how that decision on annexation will affect countries like Jordan, Egypt, and others. It was very striking to see that you you wrote about Jordan quite early on in the op-ed, made a real stress on Jordan. So I want to ask you why? Why are you this concerned about Jordan? And how, how does this reflect on UAE-Jordan relations, how much the UAE values Jordanian role? Well, I think, like I said, Jordan is a key partner for all of us as Arab countries, partner for Israel, a big partner for America. This would put them politically in a very, very awkward, uncomfortable situation. You know as well as I do the demographics inside Jordan, large Palestinian population, there could be unrest. So I think a decision like this will have as much of an impact on Jordan as, as Palestine and Ramallah. And I think it's important to make sure people understand that, that you are putting some of your best partners and your best friends in very difficult situations. And that this is, goes beyond just the Palestinian-Israeli track. So I wanted to make sure everyone's clear about that. Because that clarity is sometimes missing from the statements of Israeli officials. I mean, the prime minister of Israel has more than once said that there are Arab countries that are okay with this, that we're extending our relations with Arab countries. And he's referenced the UAE and other Arab countries saying that they don't mind about this. So, so you're countering that quite publicly. Correct. I think it was very important to be very vocal and very clear that this would harm a lot of behavior in the region, not just the Jordanian track or the Emirati track or any other country that's thinking of opening up with Israel, is this decision, while it could be in the best interest of an Israeli government, will have impact beyond the Palestinian file. Now, you attended the unveiling of the Trump peace proposal. Uh, you referenced that also in your op-ed. It's been a while since, since that peace proposal was um, unveiled. Do you feel that that's been helpful in this? Do you feel that the Trump administration has supported the, the moves towards annexation? Yeah, I, I don't want to characterize the American position on annexation because I think it's still a work in progress. But I do think that the peace proposal was a starting point. And I know that both sides have issues with parts of the pro the proposal. I don't think there's any proposal that one side will love and the other side will just hate. I think there's enough to disagree on from both sides. But our position at the time was very, very clear. The two sides should sit together. Maybe they can find a solution or a compromise. Maybe they won't. And we are not the best, you know, we are not the country that is supposed to determine whether that is acceptable or not acceptable to both sides. What we are encouraging is let the two sides sit together and figure out if there is a way forward or not. We still believe that. So there'll be some Arabs, some Emiratis, uh, who will perhaps hear of your op-ed without necessarily reading it um, and, and feel concerned, feel that this was another step in terms of normalization. And it's an emotive subject. You know that more than I do. What would your message be to them? My message is read the op-ed first. <laughs> And if they read the op-ed and still felt uncomfortable with you, with you addressing the Israeli population directly, what would you say to them? I would say 
communication is a very important part of diplomacy. When it, that applies whether you are in agreement or disagreement. If you have a friend and you have an argument and you don't have this conversation with your friend, even as a friend, depart, depending on what you disagree on, your friendship is going to suffer. I mean, and the same applies to international diplomacy and relations. When you have a relationship with a country, you have to be very clear about what you agree on and what you disagree on. And I'm sure this will offend or upset some people, but I will be comfortable knowing that we clearly and honestly articulated our position. And can I ask you also, have you informed the American administration in advance about this, this op-ed? Have you been in talks with them about it? I have. And how was it received? Uh, we'll save that for another conversation. Okay, and um, my final question for you is, is if the annexation goes ahead, I mean, you've spoken of the possible consequences um, in terms of ramifications, how people feel about it, but are there actual steps that the UAE or Arab countries or other countries may take? Are you, are you looking at those options? So honestly, I don't believe we are yet. Um, those conversations will happen when they need to be, but I think it's unwise for us to start speculating and planning moves and decisions for something that hasn't happened yet. And it's difficult to kind of say exactly what we would do or not do uh, because nothing's happened yet. But I think those conversations will happen when the time is right. But it, I'll, I'll avoid getting into specifics. All, all I will say is what we said in the op-ed, it will be a setback. It will make things that have been taking place much more difficult to have. Thank you very much, Ambassador. Is there anything you'd like to add? No, I, I think it's important for people to think about this and evaluate it objectively. Um, you know, you, like you said, you know, there's people who are going to simply be not okay with the notion that an Emirati diplomat puts something in an Israeli publication. But you know, uh, President Sadat went to Jerusalem to make a point, and he was very emphatic about it because it was in the best interest of his country. And while I am not going to Tel Aviv to give a speech, I, I think this has the same kind of value of speaking directly to an audience to make sure your message gets across to them. Can I ask you about the message? I mean, this is annexation. There's a lot of concerns, like you said, because it's about you know, not just Palestine, it's also about Jordan, and it kind of, you know, sends a signal about the, the future of the two-state solution. How is this different from the, the American uh, recognition of Jerusalem as a capital um, for Israel, the move of the embassy? How, how, do you, how do you feel that this could be more detrimental? Well, I don't know if it's going to be more or less detrimental. I just think it's very different when an American government chooses to place their embassy somewhere else even if that's a controversial decision, it is still an American decision. They have the sovereign right to put their you know, embassy wherever they like. But this land is disputed land. This is supposed to be part of a negotiation. This is supposed to be part of a two-state solution. And by moving unilaterally, you're basically saying, I don't believe in the negotiation or the two-state solution, or I'm doing something to undermine it. So those are two different sectors for me. The American government could do whatever they want with their embassy, but this land is subject to an ongoing dispute for the past 60 years, and you're essentially trying to resolve the dispute without a negotiation. Thank you very much, Ambassador Teba. It was, as ever, insightful and great to speak to you. Thank you very much, Mina.